Welcome to Spirits of Whiskey. We explore the wide world of whiskey through the many colorful personalities who make it, promote it, write about it, and more. With each podcast, Carrie Moynihan, a certified bourbon steward and bartender, and yours truly, Philip Dobar, director of the Cocktail Collection, interview whiskey's most important names. From high-profile makers, blenders, and ambassadors. To out-of-the-way innovators and remote pioneers. Join us as we discover the people and elements that give the water of life its spirit. It is Whiskey Wednesday, November 18th, 2020, and you're listening to episode 24. Today, we speak with Matt Hoffman of Seattle's Westland Distillery. But first, stay tuned for this week's Whiskey Chronicles. Hey, do you like whiskey, food, and adventure? I do. Hi, I'm Carrie. I'm Philip. I'm Louise. I'm the chef. Chef Louise Leonard, as in our World of Wheezy segment host here on the podcast, and Whiskey, a Chef's Journey. That chef. That's right, the project that started this very podcast. The series stars our very own chef, Louise Leonard, winner of Emmy-winning The Taste on ABC. And explores and connects the worlds of whiskey and food, city by city, country by country. Would you like to see this spirited culinary adventure on a TV near you? Well, you can by helping us finish the pilot episode through our crowdfunding campaign. For more information, including behind-the-scenes photos, videos, and incentives. And to make a pledge, visit our website, whiskeyachefsjourney.com. Or search for our campaign, Whiskey A Chef's Journey, at gofundme.com. That's gofundme.com now. Well, I think it's a cheers to that. <laughs> Let's. Cheers. cheers. When it comes to food and beverage, flavor is king. When it comes to whiskey, one might wonder how so many brands produce such a variety of expressions with so many different flavor profiles when each and every one of them is made from the same three ingredients, grain, yeast, and water. To answer this, we must look at all stages of production. Fermentation and distillation are major factors in determining how a whiskey will taste. A key determinant of which flavor compounds survive the spirits making process is fermentation. During this step, many chemical reactions take place, some of which help explain many of the fruity notes one tastes in the final dram. Distillation can be carried out with a pot still or continuous still, both of which come in a variety of sizes. And the choice of one still over another and one size over another also influences flavor. For a scientific overview of how fermentation and distillation affect a whiskey's flavor, please visit our website for this episode's show notes. So what is the biggest influence in the flavor of the final product? As most whiskey fans know, the main source of flavor in whiskey is from the barrel aging process. This is due to several factors. One, the type of oak used to make the barrel, American or Spanish oak, for example. Two, to what degree the interior of the barrel is toasted or charred, a practice that serves to filter out unpleasant compounds, especially sulfur. Three, the size of the barrel, a factor that determines the surface area to volume ratio. The smaller the cask, the faster the whiskey will exchange with the wood, and vice versa. Four, whether the barrel is new or used. Scotch, for example, primarily uses casks that have previously held other alcoholic beverages in them, often imparting their new make spirit with flavor components left over from the container's previous contents. Five, the environment in which the barrel is aged. Tropical environments, for example, have higher temperatures and humidity levels than colder climates. Therefore, the chemical reactions that take place during the maturation are accelerated, as opposed to the colder climates, where the same processes take longer to play out. That said, there is one outstanding argument regarding terroir in whiskey. Some maintain that terroir is a key determinant of flavor, while others argue that the distillation process, by its very nature, eliminates all traces of terroir. But we'll save that debate for another time. For now, we'll limit our discussion of terroir to how agriculture is affected by climate, soil, and topography. The same varieties of grain grown in Texas and Oregon, for example, due to a range of environmental factors, may not taste the same. By looking at it this way, one can adapt many steps in the whiskey-making process to bring out a variety of flavors while still limiting the spirit to its three basic ingredients. Most American whiskey casks, moreover, are fashioned from one species of American oak, Quercus alba. But substituting a different species of oak, Quercus gariana, for instance, yields different oak notes in the final product. Up next, we speak with Matt Hoffman of Westland Distillery about their Pacific Northwest Distillery and how it's working with their local elements to create unique flavors that showcase the region's terroir. Stay with us. The 
Center for Culinary Culture, home to the Cocktail Collection and LA Food and Drink Museum, has a YouTube channel featuring a mix of how-to, lively talk, and culinary entertainment. Already streaming are Cocktails, The Grand Tour, Culinary Quickies, Music and Booze with Mo, and this podcast, Spirits of Whiskey. New shows coming soon include Complete Greek, telling the story of Greek food one dish at a time, and Spirits of Rum, a podcast featuring personalities from the wide world of cane spirits. Find us on YouTube, the Center for Culinary Culture, and subscribe now. The Center for Culinary Culture, telling the story of food and drink one taste at a time. Today on Spirits of Whiskey, we have with us Matt Hoffman, co-founder and master distiller at Westland Distillery in Seattle, Washington. Also, and I know we'll get into this, he co-founded the American Single Malt Whiskey Commission. Welcome, Matt. Good to have you with us. Yeah, thanks for having me. Hi, Matt. So as we always start out, we would like to talk to you about your whiskey journey. When you were a wee little lad, did you (laughs) have aspirations to become (laughs) this whiskey master, or how did you decide to this into your career a young boy's whiskey dreams yeah I'm about to say maybe not as a wee little lad but uh, <laughs> to be fair actually as a wee little lad i was always really interested in flavor and where flavors would come from especially in really simple food items that you kind of grow up eating and that fascination i still exists today within me across a variety of subjects in the food and beverage industry but that fascination of the origin of flavor and trying to coax the best flavor out of something, especially simple things, eventually led me to distilled spirits, which is, of course, about capturing the essence of a raw material, and then to whiskey. And whiskey, you know, the beauty of whiskey is how simple it is on the surface of it. It's four ingredients. You know, a chef gets to use all sorts of different raw ingredients. In whiskey, it's four, and one of them is water. (laughs) So the restriction of that is what was really appealing to me and still is. There is a difficulty, beauty in that constraint Mm. And whiskey, you know, with a super humble grain like barley is one of the most complex beverages on the planet. And that has driven me from the beginning and that exploration of flavor into where we are today. Wow. And because you're in Seattle, you get to use water that salmon swim in. (laughs) I I don't think that that adds to the flavor, to be fair. Yeah, we. it's funny, you know, a lot of the distilleries talk about water quite a bit, but actually water doesn't really make a big difference. This is kind of one of the big myths, uh-huh. I think, in whiskey. Water is one of the things that distilleries want to talk about. I mean, it, it can make a difference. Don't get me wrong. It's kind of like bagels and New York water. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It, it can make a difference. <laughs> so it's just more about like, why not focus on the other things? Why not focus on the barley and focus on the fermentation things mm-hmm. that are really there to provide flavor. And that's the thing that people haven't really wanted to talk about. And that's everything that we're exploring. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Where did you grow up and when did you decide that this is how you were going to explore flavor? Well, I grew up here in the Pacific Northwest. So I live in Seattle now, but I grew up about uh, 30, 45 minutes south of here. So born and raised here all my life. You grew up near Tacoma? Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, just outside of Tacoma. So that story is an I guess an unremarkable one, you know, I grew up pretty solidly <laughs> middle class, but like interested in flavor and I don't have any family in this business. How on earth I got connected to this fascination with flavor, I don't know. You know, a big part of it was just like, just as a kid eating boxed food, you know, like prepackaged industrial food versus something made from scratch. And you notice the difference, but I, is that strong enough to account for the direction that my life has gone? I have no. I truly have no, no idea. No, yeah. no. My first career was in opera as a singer, something I discovered all on my own. It, these things, you know, you never know. You never know where kids are going to go yep. and why they go. Yeah. So that's kind of it, you know, and that, that exploration. I love being from here and I love this place. And the initial exploration from looking for flavor and the fascination of, of where things derive their flavor from eventually merged with this love of place of the Pacific Northwest. And that's where this place, which grows barley really well, which doesn't have a history of making whiskey, but has all of it. This is a better barley growing region than Scotland. Oh, wow. <laughs> you know, so that's, you know, this is one of the things you begin to put those pieces together. And, and just, you know, Carrie, just like you just did there, I went, oh, wow. And I started to put those pieces together. And you really realize that we have an opportunity to kind of be 
foundational to cuisine almost. This is something that you know, if you're a chef or a distiller or a brewer, in a lot of the U.S., we still have an opportunity to develop regional cuisine. Mm-hmm. And that's something that is a huge opportunity, I think, for me. And you know, I'm, I'm getting goosebumps just talking about it because it really does excite me, this idea that we can make something that's reflective of this place. That's great. And so what was the point in your life where you said, whiskey, that's what I'm going to do? Oh boy. You know, it's funny. I don't think that there's a simple answer to that, except that, you know, these things are all evolutions because at first, you know, you're interested in, in a variety of distilled spirits and I am interested in a variety of distilled spirits, but the types of distilled spirits I'm interested in are always exhibiting the same thing, which is provenance, mm-hmm. you know? So, so mezcal is really interesting. Eau de vies are really interesting, fruit eau de vies and whiskeys that exhibiting place really interesting to me too. And it was just that putting all the pieces together that, you know, the passion for whiskey, the history of it, by the time we started Westland back in 2010, it was very, very clear that whiskey was what I wanted to do. It's what we wanted to do as a company. And we have done nothing but whiskey ever since. Okay. And I see you went to school in Edinburgh for distilling. Yeah, I did the Harriet Watt program. So if you Mm -hmm. are interested in Learning about brewing and distilling science, you really have two options at a very high level in the world. One is the Institute of Brewing and Distilling in London, which you also, which I did a, I also did, yeah, a certificate level program. So not the top level program that they have today. They didn't have that at the time, a diploma level program. And then I did the diploma program, postgrad program at Harriet Watt in Scotland, in Edinburgh. Did it via distance learning because we were starting Westland at the same time. So ah, I was about to say you spent a fair amount of time in the island of Britain, but you just said that it was distance for at least some of the, the Edinburgh portion. Yeah, the program is really designed for people who are already in the industry uh, and okay. getting up and running who are mm-hmm. senior levels. Uh, so I had a bunch of classmates from distilleries in Ireland and, and in Scotland and Japan and, and India, as that's where everybody goes. But also most of those people are already employed at a high level in the spirits industry. And you need to take one course in person there, which is a kind of a laboratory course that we do during a summer. So, but the rest of it you can do anywhere you want, basically. Mm-hmm. That's mm-hmm. right. Did you grow up in a family that had an appreciation for alcoholic beverages, wine, beer, spirits? Not in like a connoisseur level sort of way. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's just kind of just drinking beer and the occasional spirit and uh-huh. the occasional gin and tonic and uh-huh. stuff like that. But definitely spirits in particular did not play a particularly strong role in my family growing up. Okay. All right. Is it something you took up in your college years? What was the evolution? No, that's kind of the funny thing. This doesn't make any sense when you think about it. I, you know, I was, <laughs> I mean, I was researching distilling and the concept of it before I had ever had an alcoholic beverage. What? Wow. Yeah, which, but that's but I, I came at it really just from the flavor. You fell in love with the process. Yeah, absolutely. Uh-huh. As I said at the beginning of my life, as a wee lad, you know, <laughs> as, as a wee lad, I really was interested in this flavor journey, and I just got the bit in my teeth and just totally just went head on at it. And by the time I was 15 or 16, I was reading Distilled Spirits textbooks. And again, I don't really have a good explanation for that, except that the concept has always just been super fascinating to me. And never from a perspective of, oh, Distilled Spirits are making whiskey, that's cool. It's always been from a perspective of flavor. So you've been geeking out on this stuff before it became a profession. Absolutely. Yep. Okay. What was your undergrad in? Did you try to do something in distilling for undergrad? No, because there's really no way to do an undergrad degree in distilling in this country. Was there at least science? So at the time, when I went to college, I was at the University of Washington. And I mean, distilling was a pipe dream. It was like something you're interested in. And you never think that this is going to turn into a career because it never turns into a career in this country. Like, that's just not how it works. (laughs) And then so I was still researching that, you know, in my spare time. And then I was studying economics, which is still an interesting subject to me, but I just kind of said, wait a second, I can really do this if I dedicate time to it. So I dropped out of the University of Washington in my junior year, and then that's where I began enrolling in the IBD program and the Harriet Watt program. Now, that was the challenge with the Harriet Watt program's postgrad program, and so because I had no undergrad degree, they had me go through a, there's eight courses, six of them are kind of set in stone, and two of them are usually electives, and But if you don't have the undergrad degree, they mandate these kind of biochem and chemical engineering courses. Foundational work. Yeah. But, uh, you know, actually, Mm -hmm. I loved it. Those were the toughest courses, especially the chemical engineering stuff. But I really, really enjoyed it. I really did. So it's, yeah, it went from being this kind of pipe dream and research to kind of 
I'm all in on this concept after leaving the University of Washington. Wow, that's pretty cool. It worked out okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so 2010 rolls around. They often start with clear spirits with vodka and gin while their whiskey juice is laying down. Exactly, exactly. Now, we were fortunate in that we were not needing cash flow. That's the reason why a lot of distilleries make vodka and gin of course. to mm-hmm. generate some cash flow to get to whiskey. We had enough cash flow that we knew we could get to whiskey you're selling it two or three years later, so it's not like you can do that forever. Mm-hmm. But we that was something that we were able to do and just dedicate ourselves to making single malt. Mm-hmm. Did you source early on? Nope. No, nope, not at all. Wow. No sourcing ever. Never been appealing to us. Again, because it's not, certainly from my standpoint, I am a, I am a whiskey maker who happens to be in the whiskey industry. Aha. Uh-huh. My soul is in the making of product, and you need to be able to take that. That needs to be a viable business. Aha. Uh-huh. But be able to start with something that was made by somebody else, you know, in a commodity fashion. I mean, that's what the bulk, you know, whiskey industry is, is commodity whiskey. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And that is very unappealing to me. <laughs> Yours is an instance of do what you love. Yeah, absolutely. And I was very fortunate to be able to do what I love and have business partners that saw the same vision for whiskey and for single malt here in the Pacific Northwest, mm-hmm. you know, but also dedicated my entire life to this. Right. And it's been an obsession that has been in the right place and right time. And in many ways, we're still just getting started. There's still so much more that we want to do. So mm-hmm. it's wild because we just you know celebrated our 10-year anniversary about a week ago. Uh-huh. Congratulations. Yes. Happy anniversary. Well, thank you. Yeah. It seems like it's both been forever and no time right. at all. Yeah. Kind of like COVID. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, God. Yeah. Seven years later, 2017, you join the Rémy Cointreau portfolio, one of the world's largest spirits portfolios. Talk to us about the evolution of the operation. Yeah. So very simply, we have always believed that Westland could be something more than just a local brand or even a regional brand. You know, we believe very, very strongly that American single malt whiskey is going to be a global category of spirit, you know, and it's already beginning to take that shape as there are more than 170 distilleries in this country making American single malt. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we said there's an opportunity for Westland, and this is more than just hopeless optimism, but there's an opportunity for Westland to be one of those pioneering distilleries and brands in this American single malt space. Yeah. That is not an easy thing to do. And while we were fortunate to be able to get up and running this business without, you know, white and clear spirits, to build a brand globally is not trivial and it's expensive and it's not easy. I think a lot of people that get into this business and they think that sales happen automatically and, and everybody out there is just waiting to buy your product. And that's that's really the furthest thing from the truth. So there came a point where the family that I went into business with, we were looking for maybe potential other investments, but also looking for people who could bring a strategic advantage to us in terms of distribution at a global level. Mm-hmm. But then Remy Quantro just fell in love with the business. You know, it wasn't kind of intended to be an outright purchase originally, but you know, they had purchased Brooklady right. mm-hmm. on the Isle of Isla in Scotland. Indeed. And Brooklady had always been our heroes. You know, the way that they pursued I I still remember going to Isla back in 2010, visiting Brooklady and just being blown away at their approach and how we wanted to kind of take that approach and form it and make it our own, right? You know, not copy what they're doing, but take the same spirit and begin to incorporate that into what we were doing in terms of making something reflective of place. And so the fact that Brooklady was a part of this portfolio and they're still doing all the same cool stuff that they were doing before they were purchased was pretty massive, really massive to us. Mm -hmm. And so there was an opportunity here to say, let's continue to build this thing with Remy Cointreau. Remy Cointreau promise to be in has has fulfilled that promise absolutely to be not just hands off when it comes to distilling and making whiskey but but they've actually been super supportive there's a lot of things that we're doing now that we could have never afforded to do prior to joining the Remy Quantra group a lot of the stuff we're doing in terms of funding barley agriculture research you know we're researching new varieties of barley that are designed to be sustainable uh, be grown in organic systems that are designed to have a lot of flavor, you know, sourcing of Gary Oak logs, like all that stuff we, we really couldn't afford to do before. And that's that long-term vision stuff. Mm-hmm. So for me personally, it's kind of like, do I still get to have creative control of what we're doing? Yes or no. And do the people who are still with this business, do they believe in what we're doing? Not just now, but for the long term. Because Remy Quantra checked all those boxes from my perspective, it was a great plan. Absolutely. That's wonderful. Brooke Lottie is making gin. 
<laughs> so, yes. so maybe you'll add clear spirits to your. <laughs> I don't think so. The botanist gin that Brooklady makes is awesome. Yes, indeed. And the concept is really cool as well. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's just that's the beauty of when you have a really cool concept and it gets matched with great product. They're super successful in that with that gin, and, and they love doing it. But for us, our approach is it's not this, totally the same as Brooklady. We're coming from the same spirit. Mm-hmm being evocative of place. Yeah, yeah. I'm fascinated by your hands-on approach to barley development. Yeah, this is a pretty big deal for us. When we got into this business, when I got into this business, right, the idea is about flavor. Where does flavor come from? How can we bring more flavor to the table in this very simple thing that is composed of four raw ingredients? Barley being the only grain that can be used in single malt whiskey. So how do we get the most flavor out of malted barley? The first thing that we started doing was using roasted malts. And Uh that's something that was used in the brewing industry all the time, has been for centuries, but that has its limits. We've made whiskey with that approach, which is completely different compared to the Scottish whiskey industry. But by 2012, so, so two years in, we already said, okay, we've reached the limits of what the commodity barley industry is able to give us. And when I say the commodity barley industry, that is the organization, the collection really of farmers, maltsters, academics, and brewers, uh, usually in this country, who are looking for barley that um, follows commodity standards. And commodity standards are about sameness, it's about consistency, no variation in flavor, and it's about yield, fundamentally. And we said, okay, we don't actually want a lot of this, those first few things. You know, We don't want sameness. We want uniqueness. We want flavor variation. We want to be able to have something that is different, that is unique, that is perfect being grown an hour north of Seattle, but maybe isn't perfect being grown an hour south of Seattle. You know, stuff like that is a really interesting concept to us. So we went up to the Washington State University. They have an agricultural extension center an hour north of Seattle Mm -hmm. uh, in what is known as the Skagit Valley. And the Skagit Valley is one of the last kind of traditional agricultural regions really in the United States. When I say that, I mean it's rotation-based agriculture. It's not monocrop or bicrop, so not just pure corn or corn soybean rotation. They grow 80 different crops of commercial significance in this valley, which is a small, it's like 80,000 acres. It's not big. So all of these farmers up there were growing a variety of crops, but they all needed to grow barley. And I didn't know any of this at the time when I went up there, but that's there's a reason why they're having this grain conference up there. They all needed to grow barley because barley puts carbon, puts organic matter back into the soil. So whenever they grow things that make them a lot of money, tulips or, or cabbage or whatever it is, they need to plant barley in the soil to restore it. But we get up there and we meet these farmers and these academics at Washington State University, in particular, Dr. Steve Jones, who is a, a grain researcher. He's a, he's a grain breeder by trade. And what we found up there was just astonishing. It has now developed into what I can only describe as a post-commodity agricultural system. And what I mean by that is the farmers are growing these grains in typically more healthy agricultural systems. The maltsters are able to malt different types of grains, different types of barleys that are not grown by anybody else anywhere in the world. But fundamentally, our work with the academics has been about finding, developing, breeding, the old-fashioned way, no GMO stuff, breeding new varieties of barley where they focus on flavor first. Mm -hmm. And that's a totally different approach compared to the rest of the whiskey industry. Mm -hmm. So that deep dive into barley, so looking at barley varietal flavor rather than just the roast characteristic, that deep dive into varietal flavor continues to exist for us. And actually, we'll be releasing our first whiskey made from one of these new varietals in May of 2021. That's wonderful. So I've been wanting to ask this for a while now. Where did you guys come up with the name Westland? Yeah, so there's two parts of this. One is there is some history here with the family that I started the business with, my business partners. They're kind of great-grandfather, like the first kind of pioneering person who came out to the Pacific Northwest. This was back when people would regularly name houses. So he built a house and he named that house Westland. And we actually hatched our first business plan inside of that house. So we saw that inspiration for a name, certainly. But then it was also coupled with this idea that we are trying to make something evocative of our idea of the West. The West has always represented possibility and the ability to create something new. And that's that's a really, really beautiful thing. Very cool. I like it. 
We are aging in a local species of white oak that only grows here. The Garayana, correct? The Garayana, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So that's something that, again, we dove into this like straight away. It was 2011. We sourced our first casks made from Gary Oak. And for people who are listening, the Gary Oak is the only native oak species that grows here in the Pacific Northwest. It essentially grows along the I-5 corridor, which stretches from really from Vancouver, BC at the Canadian border down to essentially San Francisco, Mm -hmm. you know, in a 50 mile wide stretch of land. And it's really, really rare, but it's very different from the American white oak that is basically used by all other whiskeys ever around the world. It's protected in some respect, is it not? Absolutely. Yeah. And it, does that present a challenge? Yeah, it does. In Victoria, BC, so it grows up a little bit into southern British Columbia. In Victoria, BC, it's a $10,000 fine if you cut one of these trees down. Wow. It is protected in most parts of the US as well. And that's because it's only growing now in 5% of its former habitat. So settlers came in and cut down 95% of it, unfortunately. So it's still protected. So all of the Gary Oak that we get that we source is all uh, naturally fallen or what's classified as hazard oak. We've also been replanting Gary Oaks as well, been working with a local organization called Forterra. Good. We have replanted 750 new mm-hmm. oaks, which you know teaches you a lot about the habitat that these oaks grow and thrive in. And it's something that as part of our Garyana whiskey program, you know, is the replanting of these Gary Oaks. Mm-hmm. So all of your wood died of natural causes. <laughs> yes, I guess you could say it like that, yeah. <laughs> which is a good thing. Sure, absolutely. Yep. Yeah, indeed. So what was the first expression you made? We have four samples here. Were any of these the original expression? The American oak is basically the original expression. When we started the business, it was, okay, four raw ingredients in single malt whiskey, malted barley, yeast for fermentation, water, and then the oak casks that it's aged in. So from the very beginning, literally from cask number one, we started with this base of roasted malts that you would essentially use if you were making like a porter for beer fans Mm -hmm. out there. Mm -hmm. It was about five different types of malted barley, four of which are roasted to different degrees, which brings out different flavors from the uh, malt between like uh, biscuit to scone to toasted marshmallow to uh, ice cream cone to uh, hazelnut to you know chocolate and coffee and things like that. So all that stuff naturally produced just by the roasting of the grain. But so that was the foundation. We call that our five malt grain bill. So that is actually in the American oak expression, the sherry wood expression, and in our peated expression. Mm-hmm. Um, although in our peated expression, we, we include people. We can get to that in a second. We ferment everything with this Belgian season. And we were looking at can we get as close to a wild yeast strain as possible? And that's how we ended up getting a a Saison style strain, a farmhouse ale yeast strain from Belgium that we have continued to use ever since for everything that we've done. Wow. Uh, Yeah. And then the new American oak that's not done at all in Scotland, more commonly seen in American whiskeys, but that American oak expression, that that's really the foundation the Okay. From the first casks of whiskey we made, it was composed of all three of those things. Wow. Matt, to be clear, we are now into the live tasting segment. Yes. Uh-huh. Very good. Of our podcast. And we hope you're tasting along with us. I have just sipped the American Oak original. Oh, you're ahead of me. I hadn't opened it yet. Oh, okay. sorry. This is a glorious nose. Let's see. Oh, yeah. It's sweet and fruity. Mm-hmm. Yes, the fruitiness. I'm glad that you mentioned that. That's one of the first things that's we always talk about actually as a, as a tasting note for me, it's orange marmalade. Mm, okay. There's the Belgian brewer's yeast that Saison yeast produces a lot of what we call esters, the fruity compounds in fermentation in particular, a lot of orange peel type flavors and a lot of kind of red, like cherry mm-hmm. fruits. So I get a lot of, for me, I get a lot of orange on the nose, but the sweetness, that's the new American oak integrating with these other flavor notes. Now, Mm-hmm. A lot of distilleries will tell you 70 to 80% of the flavor in whiskey comes from the cask. And that's a choice, you know, not an absolute. But what we're looking for from the cask is to integrate with these flavors that are coming from the raw ingredients, not drown them out. We're looking for that orange peel that we get from fermentation, plus the caramel note that comes from New American Oak, that kind of turns into orange marmalade, right? If that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah. On the palate, all of the citrus is still there very much, but spice, a lot of spice. I got cherry too on the palate. Yes. Cherry. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like the kind of cherry compote flavor. Again, that the richness there. You do get more maltiness, I think, on the palate. More of the chocolate and the coffee will come through more like a mocha mm-hmm. than true dark coffee. In our in our grain bill, we call our five malt grain bill, one of those five is something we call pale chocolate mm. malt. It's only at 4% of the total recipe, but it's responsible for those chocolatey 
and kind of mocha flavor notes, but you right. can really taste it on the palate. Mm-hmm. I also noticed the proof point, all three of your core expressions, we're starting with what you call the core range. All three of the American oak, the sherry, and the peated, all of them are at uh, 92 proof. Yes. How did you arrive at that presumably sweet spot? <laughs> 92 proof was necessary because we didn't want to chill filter our whiskeys. Mm-hmm. Now, people are listening, if you're not familiar with chill filtering, you know the main concept is a whiskey will haze. If you take whiskey straight out of a cask, put it in a bottle and then stick it in the freezer, it will turn opaque. Right. And that's something that scares a lot of people. It doesn't really affect the flavor, but when people imagine that whiskey is supposed to be clear, it kind of freaks people out. So the thing is, is that when you're chilling that whiskey down, what's happening is that those are compounds. Those, these are things coming out of solution. That's what's causing that haze. So what a lot of companies do, and anything that's bottled really at 40% alcohol by volume, they're chilling it down on purpose to make it haze, and then they filter that haze out, and then it never hazes again. Now, that might sound great, but those compounds coming out of solution, those are flavor compounds. Mm -hmm. And so to me, to us, it was like super obvious, like, why did we spend all of this time and all of this money? Because it's expensive to use these raw ingredients that have all this flavor. Right. Why would we do all of this only to strip the flavor out, Mm -hmm. you know, at the end? Mm -hmm. So when you are committed to non-chill filtering, you typically want to see a higher proof. I think the lowest I've ever seen non-chill filtered is 43 some people say 45, but 46 is pretty safe. At 46% ABV, if you take a bottle of Westland and you stick it in the freezer, yes, it will haze. But when it gets back to room temperature, all that stuff goes back into solution and it looks the same as, as anything else. But we didn't need to chill filter any of it. And thus you have all of the flavor that is with you exactly as it came out of the barrel, which is important to us. Awesome. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I just moved on to the, the sherry wood. I'm a big fan of uh, sherry finished scotches. So I'm hoping that this might be my favorite, but I don't know yet. We'll see. Yes. And is this finished in cherry or aged in sherry? Yay. Great question. The answer is both. So, <laughs> yeah. So, we, um, you can think of sherry wood as like if American oak is the trunk of a tree, sherry wood is a branch, right? Uh-huh. So, it starts with the same foundation as American oak, the same five malt recipe, the same uh, Saison yeast. It does use some new American oak in there, but some of that new American oak will, that'll go for, you know, two or three years in primary maturation, and then it would go to finishing, like a, a finishing like a lot of people are familiar with, into traditional sherry wine casks from Spain, mm-hmm. Oloroso and PX sherry wine casks. Okay, it's about a fifty-fifty split between Oloroso and PX, but then we're also taking some uh, new make spirits or straight off the still, uh, same you know again five mile recipe new American oak or sorry, uh, five more recipe and, and the Belgian yeast. And then that goes directly into the sherry cask. So, mm-hmm. so it doesn't go into new oak or anything else. Okay. So utilizing both of these techniques and then blending them together gives us more complexity, gives us more options when it comes to making a whiskey and it's released, just, just gives you more tools in your toolbox. Mm-hmm. Well, it is a lovely expression. Thank you. I'm getting the grapes on the nose and also going into the mouthfeel on this. Um, popcorn butter. Popcorn butter. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's definitely got a richness to it. The PX in particular, which is a thick, sweet dessert wine. Oloroso is mm-hmm. typically dry. Yeah, the PX note is very much present. Yeah, absolutely. And we're able to utilize more PX than I think is typical because the malt can stand up to it. You know, a lot of the distilleries in Scotland are using maybe 90% Oloroso and 10% PX, but they're not using any roasted malts. And the PX is much stronger than Oloroso. So we're able to kind of balance these things. It's like a big whiskey, but the balance is still there, which is really, really important to us. So with our peated expression, what we're trying to do, remember how I was saying, I went to Scotland and I went to Brook Lottie, fell in love with the place. I love Isla, you know, going there, the, this like magical whiskey island. That, it's, it's a beautiful island. Yes, I was in in 2015. It was fantastic. Uh, just an extraordinary place. But, you know, coming out of that, the takeaway was not, I want to copy Isla. It's... I respect what they have there, and I want to build something new that is evocative of this place that people can Mm -hmm. fall in love with in the same way. So we take the traditional aspect of peated whiskey using heavily peated malt from Baird's malting. Now, as an aside, we are pursuing our own locally peated malt, have for almost five years now been producing whiskey made with local peat, Washington state peat. Wonderful. That whiskey has not yet okay. been released, not yet been released. So what is in this expression is Scottish peated malt from Baird's. 55 part per million phenolic content. So this is kind of as strongly peated as you can buy off the shelf. But then we take that, we mash, distill, 
mature that on its own. And then we take that same five malt recipe that's in our American oak, that's in our sherry wood, mash, distill, mature that on its own, and then blend them together afterwards for a much more balanced approach to peat. And the end result is a peated whiskey that's very much unlike uh, traditional peated whiskeys. And that's entirely the point. Mm-hmm. Nice. This is very palatable. Yes. I'm guessing for someone who's not big on peat, this is very palatable. Palatable peat, if you will. Yes. As somebody who's not very big on peat, I enjoy this very much. So what kind of peat and where do you get your peat? Right. So for this expression, the Westland peated expression, this is Highland peat. So we think about an island off the southeast coast of Scotland. This is really all the way across the country, the other side and the northeastern side. And the peat there is different. So on Isla, the peat is more moss-based. And moss-based peat will break down and give you more of those classic medicinal notes, more the iodine, the band-aid, that sort of stuff. When you have other things growing in your bog, you have different flavor notes that don't entirely replace the medicinal notes, but certainly limit them and, and give you other types of smoky character. So this peat region in northeastern Scotland has a lot more sedges, a lot more grasses. That gives you a little bit more of like a campfire smoke, more or like bonfire. I mean, the peat, the medicinal note is still there, yep. but it definitely is not pure iodine at all. So what's the difference between the Westland peated whiskey and the Garyana? Yes. So the Garyana, so first of all, the three whiskeys that you just tasted, American Oak, Sherry, Wood, Peated, those are consistent in terms of their flavor profile. They have always been pretty much the same. Ooh, I like the Garyana. Uh, thank you. The Garyana expression has always been an exploration. So because the Gary Oak species doesn't have history in the whiskey world, you know, we are really pioneering this oak. We weren't the first distillery to use it, but I would definitely say we were the first distillery to try to experiment with it and try to kind of make make whiskeys that were reflective of that experimentation. And that's that's what Garyana has been as a series now in its fifth edition. So in this fifth edition, what we wanted to do is we said, okay, Gary Oak is a phenolic tree. Like that's its calling card. While we have used peat in a previous edition of Garyana, we have never made the phenolics a sole focus of Garyana before. Again, part of this is not just about what we've released before, but it's never been done before by anybody. So we want to explore that ourselves. So what we said was, okay, let's take heavily peated malt. So it's that same uh, Baird's heavily peated malt, 55 part per million phenolic content, off the still directly into virgin Gary Oak casks. So it's heavily, you know, very phenolic spirit into very phenolic casks. And we put those things together. Now, when it comes to a Garyana release, the Garyana Oak is super, super powerful. Now, some people like really powerful oak notes, but as I said before, balance is really important to us. So we blend that with some we call pale malt, so just lightly kilned uh, malted barley in previously used bourbon casks as kind of the spacer in there to allow for all of these Gary Oak and peat flavor notes to breathe. Mm -hmm. And the end result is a whiskey that is totally focused on these dueling phenolic sources in the whiskey. And it's interesting because to me, like you can taste, there's things in there that like, okay, that's definitely peat. Mm -hmm. You know, there's some parts in there I can go, this, I can taste the medicinal note, but then I can also taste like that Kansas City barbecue or like burnt mm-hmm. ends. Is any big barbecue fans listening? I'm making burnt ends on Sunday. Burnt ends. Oh, fantastic. So good. Yeah, so good. <laughs> so that's a Gary Oak note. And there's all of these other like phenolic notes in between that are just a mixture of the two. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of hard to know where one ends and the other begins. Given what you're saying, one might expect this to be more tannic, but that's not coming through. Yeah, so thank you. So that's a big part of the phenolic nature of Gary Oak. A big part of that is because it does, as a tree species, have a lot of tannins in it naturally. Once those tannins are broken down, a lot of the compounds that make up those tannins become these phenolic flavor notes once they're kind of released. So it's it's a part of that process. Okay, yeah, there we go. I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that this is, I think, probably my favorite single malt peated expression that I've had in quite some time. I think it's a very, oh, thank you very it's much. very balanced. I like that. Um, the problem that I have with a lot of the Isla expressions is that I feel that they're overly medicinal, overly smoky. But this is just the balance is amazing on how you can still get all these different flavors from the wood coming out, not just the flavors from the peat. Really mm-hmm. like yeah, thank you. And again, that's a big part of our focus on our house style. Now, this expression comes from your outpost range. There are two other expressions in it. Are there not? So the outpost range is about you know, this collection of three whiskeys, which includes Gariana, but now includes colere, which is a Latin word, which means to cultivate. 
which is focused on barley and not just barley varietals, but also reconnecting to barley agriculture. And then solum, which is Latin for soil, and that's focusing on the local peat and exploring this, this peat that we have here in Washington State, which is very different from Scottish peat, and what that could potentially give us. So we've been making these whiskeys now for years. Colere, in full honesty, we were hoping to release this year. Yeah. But we all know how 2020 went. And while we were comfortable continuing to addition to release a new edition of Gariana, we didn't want to release something mm-hmm. as new and as important as Colere, especially with, you know, frankly, a lot of our friends out there in the trade are hurting right now. Right. You know, mm-hmm. people in bars and restaurants and, you know, it just didn't seem right to release something. And people doing whiskey podcasts. Yep. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> sure. <laughs> sure. Now, this notion of climate, much of eastern Washington state is desert. And Western Washington State, there are these microclimates, some of which are quite wet and approximate the Scottish climate. Exactly. Yeah. So Washington State is beautiful from a barley growing region in that it it captures both the type of climate you get in the UK Mm -hmm. for barley growing, but also the type of climate you get in France and Germany, which is also, you know, they grow a lot of barley there. In fact, most of the Scottish whiskey industry sources barley from that part of Europe. They just don't tell you about it. But we have these two different sources of barley uh, growing regions, which give you different characteristics. So we have been sourcing most of the barley that we've used has been from the Palouse, which grows barley really, really well. It thrives over there, especially in dry land farming conditions. But then, you know, a lot of the exploration that we've done since then has been west of the Cascades here, where the climate is more similar to the UK. Mm -hmm. So barley can thrive in both conditions because what we have here in the Pacific Northwest is is actually a Mediterranean climate. A lot of people, even people living in Seattle, think, whoa, that's strange. But you know, Mediterranean climate is about mild, wet winters. Mm -hmm. Uh, People who live here in Seattle know that it doesn't snow, Mm -hmm. uh, even though we're the most northern major city in the US. But also, importantly, very dry summers. And that's where barley really, really thrives. So when it's non-COVID times, do you guys offer tours and whatnot? <laughs> yes, in non-COVID times, we do. Right now, in the current health guidance that we've gotten from King County, is we're able to do tastings in limited quantities, but no tours for the time being. We're working on a virtual tour program, which we hope will be a good substitute, uh, not just for people who are living here in COVID times, but actually for people around the country and around the world who'd like to take a tour of Westland but have never been here before or can't come here for whatever reason. But yeah, we always show people how we make everything. In fact, we once had an intellectual property attorney come take a tour with us, and she said that we were alarmingly transparent, (laughs) uh, which I always take as a as a with a as a badge of honor you know is we we want to tell people everything that we're doing we're totally transparent about what goes into our whiskey uh, which is if that sounds reasonable to people listening is not really the industry standard frankly right no um, you know we want we want to be transparent so mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah you uh co-founded the american single malt whiskey commission yes how close are we to washington's the ttb's issuing a single malt category establishing a single malt category Boy, that's a great question. I would love to know the answer to that. Um, <laughs> All right. Well, when you hear, you let us know. Truthfully, so what, what so year did you found for, the commission? What year did you found the commission? Yeah, so how, how long of a road is this? We started this in March of 2016 is when we gathered together. Well, we sent an open invitation to anybody that we knew was making single malts. Met together in Chicago at an industry conference and uh, with eight other producers of American single malt. And we said, the reason behind this was the words on a bottle of, of West let's say American single malt whiskey, those words don't mean anything. That's not ideal because mm-hmm. there's a lot of people, you know, if you're in the industry, there's a lot of people familiar with uh, the Scottish Whiskey Association, which is a very restrictive organization, but protects the integrity of Scottish whiskey, but, you know, kind of has, has become a police force for what Scotch whiskey is supposed to be. On the flip side of that, you have what's happening in the Japanese whiskey industry right now, which has extraordinarily right. loose regulations. In yeah. It. So that damages the integrity of Japanese whiskey. So we wanted something that said, when you buy a bottle of American single malt whiskey, you know that it is going to be, one, made in America, two, coming from one distillery, that's the single and single malt, three, made from 100% malted barley. You know, So it's it just puts enough meaning and definition to those words. Right. Consumers are getting what they pay for, frankly, and that's really important to us. So we started with that group of, of nine of us, 
and form this commission. Everything's been totally transparent. So if anybody wants to read about it, it's American Single Malt Whiskey with an E. Dot org. And we have now grown that group to more than 170 producing distilleries. So this is not just wow. that there are 170 producing distilleries in the US, but 170 distilleries as a part of the commission. And together, we submitted the formal petition for what's what we call a standard of identity, which is a, a definition. So bourbon is a standard right. of identity that protects what bourbon is for American single malt. We petitioned that, we sent that into the TTB last summer. The general idea, so the TTB, as it happened in kind of a beautiful act of serendipity, had opened its books for the first time in like 30 years to potential new rules, mm. potential new updates to its uh, beverage, beverage alcohol manual. And so the TTB happened to be accepting submissions. We submitted ours in. We've gotten a lot of positive feedback from the TTB because of the consensus we've gotten from the industry, not just the distillers, but also you know, people in the trade, distributors, and a lot of consumers have been very excited about it. They have received hundreds of other types of submissions. So they're kind of going through these like in like batches of five or 10 at a time and making rulings on them. Right. So we are hopeful that we'll have something out by maybe the middle of next year. Okay. One way or the other. But, you know, we're feeling really confident about it. We really are. Well, that's good because I'm a huge single malt fan. So. I would be very happy to have an American single malt regulation showing what it really is instead of just, oh, well, you know, it's whiskey and we've made it here. And it's what's in it? <laughs> the upside to this is so strong. It still allows for innovation in the category. You know, that's the main thing that makes American single malt really different from our counterparts in Scotland and Japan is that a lot of distilleries, not just Westland, are taking the opportunity to really push boundaries and make something that is reflective of place. But we're all doing it in a way that still, if we were in Scotland, right. we could still, we would be able to call this Scottish single malt. Exactly. You know, that's important to the integrity of the category, you know, for, for people who are buying spirits. So we're not trying to pull a fast one on anybody here. In fact, we're trying to do the opposite. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's the upside there. And we've not really, we've not received any pushback. Just kind of a matter of time, I think. I hope. <laughs> yeah, that's wonderful. Yeah, it's long in coming. Yes. And overdue. Yep, I would agree. All right, cocktails. So cocktails. Yes, absolutely. Do you like them? Yes, love them. Yes. Okay, so we never ask people what their favorite cocktail is. That's too limiting. Do you have a favorite category? Is there a go-to? I like. Uh, I don't know if I'd call it the classics, but I would definitely call it simple cocktails. Mm -hmm. It's to me the best cocktails are ones that. For the home cocktail person, I mean, not necessarily for, if you're in the trade, it's a little bit different. And if, if that's your profession, it's a little bit different. But if you're at home, right. you want to make a cocktail, I think it needs to be relatively easy to make. It needs to be relatively simple, but also just from my personal approach to cocktails, whether I'm consuming them from a, a professional mixologist or making it myself, is I want to be able to taste the spirit. I don't want to have the spirit be drowned out by something. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's just because I come at it from a perspective of, you know, all this, we put all this flavor into the spirit to begin with. So it's kind of a waste in many ways if you can't taste those things. Sure. But, you know, like for me, my favorite cocktail, I'll answer the question anyway, is a Manhattan. Uh -huh. You know, very, you know, it's super simple, but especially like, okay, I'm going to sound biased because I have an influence within Westland and <laughs> I love Westland, obviously, but. I genuinely think that our American oak expression makes just the perfect Manhattan. I can see that. You no, know, it's those dark multi flavors and that dark cherry notes. I can see that. I may make one out of that tonight. Yeah. You know, it's the, the flavors of that plus the sweet vermouth and a, and a good high quality cherry. Mm -hmm. It all like those flavors match. Yeah. So those types of cocktails are some of my favorites. Although even in non whiskey cocktails, I'm really beginning to appreciate savory cocktails as well. Okay. Especially from a food pairing perspective. Uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah. We always ask our guests also if it's not Westland, if it's a clear spirit, what is your call? Oh man, I tend to go with recommendations on non clears. I mean. It depends on, on what the focus is. I mean, I, I love a good gin and tonic. I should probably say that I love, these are all botanist gin and tonics and martinis, but... That's okay. I was going to say, it's probably botanist. But cocktails are so important to our American drinking traditions, and especially if it's done in a way that celebrates and, and highlights. You know, there's, when you make a Manhattan out of our American oak expression, you're getting something that is greater than the sum of its parts. Right, yeah. So why would I not celebrate that? You know, as a person who... If we go all the way back to the beginning, as somebody who's fundamentally in this because I'm interested in flavor, yeah, why would I not? For sure. 
Mm-hmm. Yes. Matt, thank you so much for taking time out to talk to us today. This has been really fun and very educational. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. I am hoping that we can get up to Seattle sometime soon and, you know, and the tours will be open and we can come check your place out. And if you have any new expressions coming out, please let us know. We'd love to tell people all about it. Yeah, will do. No, it's a real pleasure being able to speak with you both today. So really enjoyed it. Have you heard about Anchor? It's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. It's free. There's creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or your computer. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you. So it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Hey, Louise, welcome back. We just got off the phone with Matt over at Westland Distilleries, and we had four of their expressions, two of them peated, two of them non-peated, and I dropped some off to you. What did you think? Love, 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 loved the Westland Gariana. Loved it. I did too, and I was really surprised about that. You know me, I don't really like peat, but it was really subtle, and it was really, it was not overly medicinal, which I liked. Yeah, I loved it. And it immediately like took me to like some beautiful locale in, you know, the Pacific Northwest in Washington. I'm like, here I am. I'm I'm drinking this whiskey. I'm cooking a huge chunk of beef over open flame. I'm wearing a big like cable knit sweater. There's giant trees all around me. Like that's immediately what I started thinking about the minute I tasted it. I totally agree with you. And the when we were tasting this with Matt earlier, I just, I really fell in love with the, with the essence of it. And I loved that the wood, you know, they've got these Gary Oaks out there and that's what they're using for this Garyana expression. And I thought, well, that's interesting. I didn't know there was another species of oak up in the Northwest that was called Gary Oak. Yeah, I know. I loved that too. And I, that's why I was thinking like, you know, Snake River Farms is there in Washington and I've, I've cooked with their products before. I mean, they do this American Wagyu beef that is unbelievable. So I, and you know how I like to go camping and I like to cook me some meat over an open fire. I was thinking, man, I'd get one of those giant tomahawk steaks and put some of that Gary Oak, you know, in a pit and and put a grate over it, call it a day. You really, I mean, I that that would be my pairing. And then I was also thinking, well, and if I had some some beef stewit from some of that Wagyu, I would cook some potatoes in that to go along with the steak with some rosemary Ooh. and garlic and yeah. that's it. I mean, Yum. again, a very seemingly simple pairing, but I wouldn't want to do anything too complicated. I feel like it would take away from it. And I just feel like that that expression begs to be paired with something that's either been smoked or cooked over open fire for sure. Yeah, I'm actually uh, smoking some uh, pork today. I'm going to make some burnt ends, um, but I think I'm going to save the last bit of my, my Gariana sample to uh, to have with that when it's all done. Oh, yeah. I do have some oak chips that I can put in there and get some more oak. I don't have Gary Oak, um, but yeah, that's hard to come by. You have to, it's kind of illegal to cut them down. You have to wait till they fall or die, and then that's how they get their their wood. Uh-huh. Um, but uh, I do have some oak that I could toss in there. And uh, yeah, so I think I'll have some more of that this afternoon. Sounds delicious. Yeah. Well, great. Well, thank you so much. We will talk to you next week about the next expression. All right. I will talk to you then. For show notes on today's podcast, please visit our website at spiritsofwhiskey.com. That's whiskey with an E. We'll include links and supporting documents from today's Whiskey Chronicles, as well as tasting notes and recommendations from today's World of Wheezy. As always, you'll see upcoming topics, a guest roster, and links to past shows. Thanks for joining us. Until next time, salon. Salon You can become a sustaining supporter of Spirits of Whiskey by making a monthly donation. Just visit the Spirits of Whiskey page at anchor.fm. That's anchor.fm forward slash spirits dash of dash whiskey and click on the support button. And if you really like us, give us a five star rating and a review. Thank you. Spirits of Whiskey is produced by First Real Entertainment and the Center for Culinary Culture, home of the Cocktail Collection, and is available via Anchor, Apple, Google, iHeartRadio, Spotify, and wherever fine podcasts are heard.